This is another video in a series about the Altair 680 that you see here. In this video, we're going to work on getting a disk drive up and running with this computer. Now, if you haven't watched the other videos in this series, I would highly recommend watching those first. It'll give you the background that uh, will make today's video a little easier to understand. To make it easy, I put a link to the playlist right below this video. So go ahead and uh, watch those earlier videos if you haven't already. When MITS designed their five and a quarter inch mini disk drive, it was clear they intended it to be used with the Altair 680 as well as with the 8800 computer. And you can see that in this flyer here that came out before the product was released. Up there in the upper right corner, they talk about the 68 MDS as well as the 88 MDS. This brochure also talks about the disk controller that would have gone into the 680 computer being a single board instead of the two board set that was used inside the Altair 8800. Do a little more digging, you can find this picture of that controller board even. But unfortunately, this is the end of the line for the disk and the 680 computer. Pertech canceled the Altair 680 version of the disk drive along with a number of Altair projects as they took over day-to-day -day operation of MITS after they bought them out in 1976. So if you were the owner of an Altair 680, you were pretty much stuck in the uh, paper tape and cassette world. That is, unless, of course, you wanted to do something about it yourself. And that's what we're going to look at in this video today. How can we hook a disk drive up to the 680 and make it work on our own? Without a floppy disk controller, you might think that the only answer to add disk drives to the 680 would be to design your own controller and build it. But I'd say that's beyond the uh, capabilities of the typical homebrew hobbyist, especially back in the mid-70s. But interestingly, one of the easiest way to add drives to this computer was another product in Pertec's own product line. And that's this FD3712 drive you see here. This is basically just a repackaging of the FD360 made by a company called ICOM. Pertech bought ICOM the same year they bought MITS in the Altair product line. And one of the main reasons they bought them was to get a hold of the FD360 drive, which they have repackaged here to put the two disk drives side by side instead of on top of each other. But other than that, this is the same as an FD360. Now what's cool about this drive is that it made it easy to add dual 8-inch IBM compatible drives to pretty much any computer system. And it did this by putting the complex disk controller in the drive cabinet and only requiring a very simple parallel interface back in the host computer. And that parallel interface was probably a card that already existed for most computers. And that's the case for the 680 as well. And we'll take a look at the parallel card we're using in just a minute. Um, now, originally the target audience for this disk drive was mini computers like DEC and Data General. This was actually available, at least the FD360 was, prior to the Altair ever shipping. Um, but then it became popular once mini, or excuse me, microcomputers were coming out as well because it was a good way to add a drive to pretty much any microcomputer, even if you didn't have a controller for it yet. Now, if we take a look inside this, you can see how complex this disk controller is. And actually, what you're looking at here is only half of the disk controller. Uh, beneath that is another board of the exact same size. Whoops, if I can get around here. You can see it down below, right down in there. So there's that many chips all over again. For a total of, banging into too many things, for a total of about 150 chips to make up this disk controller. Now the parallel interface from this comes off of these two connectors you see here in the back. This one here and this one. This right here has two incoming 8-bit ports. One contains command data, one contains the data to be written to the disk. On this connector is another 8-bit port that contains status data going back to the host as well as the read data if you were doing a read operation. Now presently I have this all going to a single 50 pin cable, so that's what we're going to want to adapt to work with the Altair um, computer. Now over here in the Altair, here on the very top, on top of the two RAM boards, and now I've used all three slots in this card cage, so I'm maxed out, you can see what's called the UIO board. It stood for Universal I.O. This includes two 6820s on here, those give us two 8-bit ports each, so we've got plenty to handle the three 8-bit ports we need going over to the disk controller. Now those 8-bit ports are always on, always one direction, no handshake lines are needed. Uh, it's a very simple parallel interface. Now um, connection over to that will be through these two 24-pin dip sockets, and we'll show you how we're going to do that in a minute. Um, this board was called the UIO for Universal I.O. in addition to the parallel ports, 
that provided a serial port with a 6850. Um, and then over here is another parallel port that could connect through here. This is an unlatched port, um, bi-directional, and two address lines are available for it. And then finally up here, no, oh no, it's these right here. These eight switch positions can be read as a port. So you could input a parameter or a setting uh, via those switches. All right, now to hook this over to the um, disc controller, we're obviously gonna have to do something to convert from these 24 pin headers to the 50 pin cable that we wanna keep coming out of this disc drive. So back in the day, you would have made a prototype, uh, you would have made a board on a, on a proto board or a perf board and, and hand wired it in an afternoon to mix and match all those wires. Uh, the other problem we have is that the outputs of these 6820s are not buffered and they don't have the drive capability to run the, um, the long cable and the pull-up resistors that are used. So we're gonna have to put TTL buffers in the middle just to make this all happen. All right, so uh, that interface board, again, is something you would typically have handmade back in the day, but in today's world, it's almost just as easy, if not easier, to go ahead and make a circuit board. And it's pretty inexpensive. So I, I cheated a bit, let's call it, and I just had a, a circuit, I made a circuit board. And so here you can see the connector 50 pin over to the disk drive. And here's the two 24 pin headers that will take the ribbon cable from those 24 pin sockets. And then we have our TTL buffer chips. Power I can just grab off of the, the UIO board and have some capacitors to smooth it out a bit. All right, we'll go ahead and get this hooked up and then we'll take a uh, look at loading up the editor assembler like we did in previous videos. And we'll go ahead and write some software to see if we can get this drive to talk to our computer. All right, I now have this Altair connected to the disk drive. You can see the two ribbon cables hooked to the 24 pin connectors. That's the parallel interface going to the 50 pin ribbon cable that goes in the drive. And I have written some software utilities in assembly that allow me to use this 680 and fully exercise this drive. I can read and write sectors, I can seek tracks, select drives, that kind of thing. And those routines will allow me to then write software to actually take advantage of the disk drive and um, improve the performance or the time to load Altair Basic and the Assembler Editor. All right now I tried to limit how many features I put into the disk utility so that it wasn't too big a deal to write, um, but even so it ended up coming out over 300 lines so it was significant development and I did that whole development in the Altair Assembler Editor that you've seen in previous videos. And like you saw there that has to run with the teletype because the paper tape punch and reader are used for mass storage. Um, but as you saw in that video, it's unbearably slow. It's 35 minutes to load the assembler editor and then this source file to get it in to begin working on it is now another 15 minutes. So a total of 50 minutes, almost an hour, just to get started, which of course is just unbearable. And I may be hardcore, but I'm not so hardcore that I can put up with that. So I have cheated a bit and I used a PC with a terminal emulator to essentially give myself a 9600 baud teletype. Um, so I can load this all in under a minute. Uh, whenever it needs a tape read, I can of course send a file. Whenever it needs to punch a tape, I can of course save that file as that data comes in from the terminal emulator through the serial port. So I did that cheat and today we're going to run this terminal. Um, I've already loaded this up with a terminal emulator so that way we can have 9600 baud and don't have to listen to that teletype or try to see on that uh, difficult to read paper. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we've got here with this utility and prove that we got the disk drive working. I've already got the assembler editor loaded and I've loaded our source file in here as well. So to use this, it has commands. It's just a lot like Ed. You go to the beginning and I can say type 20 lines. Now instead of hitting return, you hit escape twice to initiate a command. So there's the first 20 lines of the file. And I can go forward, say, 60 lines and type another 20 lines. Or I can go to the end. Z goes to the end. I can come back 20 lines and then type 20. This will be the last 20 lines of the file. So that's the editor. Uh, if you want to then assemble it, you type G to go into the assembler. It's asking if you want to overwrite the editor. I'll say no so that it stays in memory. And this works like the typical Motorola assemblers of the day where you manually run the two passes. 1P is pass 1, that's where it goes through everything and it builds the symbol table. And then on the second pass you have a few options. You can generate just a listing, you can punch a paper tape, um, and things like that. Now, 
what we'll do is go ahead and, okay, so that first pass is done already with no errors. It took about 15 seconds. I'm gonna do the second pass and do a listing. And so this will actually then generate the code and put it into memory for us. I have it going into memory up at 5,000. And you'll actually see the listing come out as we do this. So here's all the equates for the, here's all the equates for the PIA on that UIO board. And then here we're actually into the code. All of this is initializing those uh, PIAs on the UIO board. Here you can see all the different menu options we have. Here's seek to track, here's select drive, restore to drive zero, here's read sector loop, upcoming will be the right sector loop. This do command is the lowest level IO to that board where it actually sends it. And then I have some console IO routines. And then these are the, the menu messages. All right, so that's the whole thing. It actually assembles pretty quick. If I was just punching a tape, it would be quicker than watching that whole uh, menu go by. But I can now exit back to the monitor and I can run this by jumping to 5,000. All right, and uh, you see I have a number of options. I can select drive zero or one, which is done with A or B. I can home it, which goes to track zero using the restore feature, actually detecting the track zero switch. One to nine will seek to tracks one to nine. Read reads the next sector. You can see it's keeping track of the sector down here. So the current sector is zero. That's not even a valid sector. The first sector is one. So the read next sector will read one and write current sector allows me to write something back. We'll see that in just a second. All right, so let me zoom back a little bit here so we can see this. So right now you see drive one is selected. I'll go ahead and do the select drive two and you'll see it select drive two and go back to drive zero. Well, drive one, zero and one, one and two. You can see that it can select them. All right, and I can do a home. Let's see, let's select drive one. And I'll do a, no, let me do, let's see. B is drive one. I'll do a home. You'll hear it click to actually do it. I can seek to track nine or seek back to track four. Now, of course, you can't see that, that it's happening, but when I did this originally, I had the cover off and I could watch that head moving and see that it was really doing it. Now in drive one, I have a newly formatted disk. So the entire content will be E5 per the typical IBM standard. Now, one nice thing about this disk drive is one of its shortcomings, it cannot format a disk. So despite the complexity of that controller, all those ICs, it still couldn't actually even format a disk. You can see what a big difference it was when that Western Digital 40-pin IC came along. It would eliminate 95% of the chips you saw there, and it could format also. But anyway, since I have to buy pre-formatted disks, that's one less thing I have to worry about with this utility is formatting the disk, because I can only use a pre-formatted disk. All right, so let's go ahead and, and show you how this would work. Um, I've got drive one selected and I can go to track eight and I type in an eight. So I'm on track eight now. And let's go read sector one is now in memory and I'll read sector two is now in memory and I can go into memory at a thousand, that's where it reads it and look. And you can see we have a bunch of E5s. All right, so let's go ahead and change a thousand and we'll change it to zero eight because we're on track eight and I'll put in a zero two because we're gonna be on sector two. And then I'll jump back to the warm start loop in this. Whoops. Okay, so it knows we're on sector two. So now when I do the write, it's going to write what we just modified. So now we should have written um, 0802 to the first two bytes of track eight, sector two. Let's do something else. Let's go to sector or track two. I'll type a two that seeks the track two. And then uh, let's read sector five. So there's sector one, two, three, four, five. So you can see that it's red five. So we'll go out to the monitor, modify a thousand. Again, we have all the E5s because this is just a formatted disk. So let's modify a thousand, whoops. And let's put in two for track two and five because we're on sector five. And let's jump back into the program and then we're gonna write sector five. All right, so now let's go back to what we did first, which was track eight. So I'll seek to track eight, and we wanna read sector two. So there's one, two. So sector two is now in memory. Exit to memory, examine a thousand. And there's our track eight and sector two that we manually punched in there. So it looks like that's all working.
All right, and now the other one was track two, sector five. So I'll seek to sec or track two, and then read up to five. Okay, so I've now read five, and if I exit and examine, you can see there's our sector two, our track two, sector five. So we're able to seek, read, write, do homes, select drives. Um, we've proven that we can actually make this drive work as we expected. And the other good news is I have software routines now that I can incorporate into whatever I want to do in the end. I have read sector, write sector, home, um, seek tracks, etc. So I'm in good shape to go make this work. And what I want to do is make Altair Basic load from disk and use disk for saving files instead of paper tape. That takes well over half an hour to do anything. Likewise, for the assembler editor, I want to use the disk to load it to make it load quickly instead of taking 50 minutes to load for example, this program that we're working on right here. And that's what we're gonna do in the next video. Now, what you'll find is that what we do in the next video very closely parallels what I did on the 8080 in a previous video series. You may wanna watch that as well, because it'll give more details about what we're doing. Uh, the title on that, if you wanna just do a search, would, would be connecting a floppy drive to an early Altair. So maybe in YouTube, search for floppy drive early Altair. And it showed me how we got a disk drive going on an early 8080 back in the days before there was any available for the Altair and there was no operating systems yet.